All right. Thank you, Loretta. And thank you, Denise, for the introduction. And uh, what a fundraising day. My name is Mo Waja. I'm a professional speaker, marketer, author, the host of the Let's Talk Show podcast, and currently I'm an account manager at Blakely. And today, I am here to talk speaking with all of you. Now, on a personal note before we begin, I just want to say that talking about public speaking here today is significant for me. Because public speaking and the art of how to speak and present effectively is very much how I got my start within industry a number of years ago. Whether it be as a competitive speaker during university, starting a public speaking association within Ryerson University, or then moving on to speak professionally, talking on branding, entrepreneurship, and the art of professional communication. Public speaking is something that has always been really important to me, and I believe kind of critical, not just to our industry, but to any and every sector out there. But for our industry in particular, the industry of the nonprofit, it is specifically important because our industry is built from stories. If I can riff on the theme of the conference for a moment, I see storytelling as the first stitch in the fabric of fundraising. Because stories are how we connect with people interpersonally. They're how we connect with our own cause, the story of the people or the living beings that we serve, whatever or whomever that may be. And they're how we generate a community of supporters because people connect with stories. They empathize with stories. That's how people see themselves in our beneficiaries and feel connected to cause. But stories are valuable only when they can be told. And that's not just through the spoken word, as I'm doing now, that's through written word, that's through DM packages, that's through appeals. But when you get right to the core of how stories are told effectively, it comes back to the way we speak interpersonally. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight right off the bat is that what we're talking about here, when we're talking about speaking and communication and professional speaking, it's not just about those client-facing individuals who need to get up in front of uh, donors or prospects or people in general and give a speech of some kind about the work that they or the organization does. Every single person within an organization as a representative of that organization is a storyteller because they're speaking to friends, families, networks, not just formally but socially about the work that they do. Our industry is unique because people are singularly passionate about the work that they do. And so by becoming good storytellers, by becoming true good speakers, we have an advantage in our capacity to communicate our nonprofit story outwards to a greater variety of people through simple human contact. So when we're talking about public speaking, what I'm not talking about is the art of getting up on stage and putting on a persona. I'm talking about a lifestyle choice to make the active decision to be strategic in the way that we connect with other people. But in order to understand how to be strategic in our communication and the way that we speak and connect with other humans, I like to start with kind of showing you what good speaking does not look like. Now, for warning, I am gonna to use Toastmasters as an example, but this is not meant to be like a big shot at Toastmasters generally. Toastmasters is great work, it helps people overcome their fears, their challenges, and comfort level with public speaking. However, I will say, and this may be a controversial opinion, that a lot of what Toastmasters teaches is very old school speaking. It's very performance speaking. And that's what we're gonna look at for about 15 seconds because that's all of this video that I can take. <laughs> She turned 100. Yeah! 
And that's about all of that. <laughs> that's, that's about all of that that I can take. So, what we're seeing here is a, it's a pretty like, extreme example, but it is an example of how public speaking has been taught historically. It's this thing where you get on stage and now suddenly you're in front of people or you switch gears and someone's asked you about your work. So suddenly now you're into speaker mode. I've gone from, hi, my name is Motu. Hello, my name is Mo Waja. And I'm here to talk about speaking with all of you, right? Like that is a lot of how public speaking was taught. I once watched a video back when I was in university and, and had a professor try to teach public speaking. And they literally showed a video with, you know, an older gentleman, you know, good silver hair, button-up shirt and a three-piece suit, turn around in his chair from a, a fake bookshelf and say, hi, do you want to learn about public speaking? Well, public speaking is a very important thing that we in the business world need to know how to do, right? So my point is that public speaking has evolved. The way that we address people and approach an audience has evolved. It's no longer a performance piece where we get on stage and suddenly become speaker us. What we're looking for is to change the dynamic by which we communicate effectively with other people so that we are able to communicate effectively regardless of context. Good speaking, effective speaking, clear speaking, and confident communication is a lifestyle decision. So what we're going to be talking about over the next minutes is something that I would like to at least have us try implementing generally into our lives as we network at fundraising day, as we attend the after party, because all of these things have both social and business value in terms of how we go about connecting with other humans. But in order to understand how we go about communicating strategically, the first thing I like to do is talk about why we speak, why speaking is important. Because a lot of the time when you ask the question, why do you speak or why do we speak? And I've, I've done this kind of mini survey individually, one-on-one -on -one, with classes or with larger scale audiences. You get a variety of responses. I speak to inspire. I speak to grow my business. I speak to become a better conversationalist. I speak because I'm really bad at dating and so I want to be better at it. I speak because I want to be able to network more effectively and make deeper connections. But while all of those things are true and are fair and are personal and have value, what we want to do is put a microscope on the idea of why people speak and get to the core of it. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you the answer to this question. We speak to get people to do a thing. We speak to get people to do something, whether it's to feel inspired, change something about their lives, whether it's to buy our product or to join our community of supporters. When we think about the idea of speaking intentionally, it comes down to getting people to do something. And the scope of that ranges from actually getting people to become, for example, a major donor or a monthly donor, to convincing your friends to go see that movie that they don't really want to see, but that you definitely want to see, right? Speaking is persuasion. Intentional communication is about convincing people to change their mindset in some way. And on a level that sounds somewhat manipulative, but the reality is that every time we communicate with other people, we have a perception and a perspective of something that we believe is right and true and good within our own minds. And other people have different lived experiences that don't always connect with those things. And so when we're speaking intentionally, what we're doing is looking for ways to get people to do a thing. That thing may change over time, but if we build our speaking strategy on the foundation of persuasion, that is something that allows us to more effectively connect with other people. In order to do that, we need to use good communication. And good communication has three major pillars. Authority, clarity, and confidence. Any two of those pillars can generally sort of stand alone and promote sort of good speaking. But to be a very good speaker, to connect with people most effectively, you want all of those things working for you, supporting your communication simultaneously. And we're gonna go through each of those, or at least touch on each of those, in turn looking at the idea of what authority is, and then further on, looking at how we structure a presentation broadly to mirror the impact of the story, and so do clear communication, and then how we can reformat body language and voice in order to connect more effectively one-on-one, -on -one, in a small group, or in front of a large audience. So, with that said, let's talk about how we get there. Because one of the first things that we need to overcome every time we stand in front of an audience is the idea of a credibility challenge. And that's why all three of these pillars are important, working together. Because the reality is that every time you connect with people, they are doing a kind of cost-benefit analysis in their head. 
I mean, at fundraising day alone, there are multiple sessions happening simultaneously. So all of you consciously or unconsciously did a cost-benefit analysis to determine whether or not you actually want to be in this room listening to me talk about speaking. Some of you may have read something I wrote, some of you may have seen me speak at Congress, or some of you may have connected with me elsewhere, but many of you don't. So there had to be a decision that was made about whether or not you're gonna to come to this session. Just like every other person, particularly people who have no social onus to listen to you, are gonna make a decision about whether or not they should listen to the words that you're saying, or in a situation like this, spend an hour in the room listening to you talk about something that you think you're gonna get value off of. The challenge, of course, is credibility. Do you seem like someone who reasonably is capable of delivering value to the life of the person making that decision? And that comes down to two things, technical credibility, and perceived credibility. <coughs> Technical credibility is like your resume. Like if you wrote every bit, bit of knowledge and experience and thing you've done down on a really long sheet of paper and handed it to people to read, that's your technical credibility. It's all of the knowledge and experiences that exist within your mind that have built you into the person that you are today. But if that is not communicated, it has very little value, which is why we also have perceived credibility. Perceived credibility is how you say what you say, how you convey your knowledge. It's your body language, it's your eye contact, it's your voice. It's all of the things that make people want to listen to a person before they even start hearing the information. These two things need to work in tandem, and that's what we're gonna be addressing today. Because when you're looking at technical versus perceived credibility, the knowledge within your mind, the knowledge and experience that you have, have relatively little value if you can't actually convey them outwards. It's great to know a lot of things, and perhaps there are positions out there that don't require you to actually convey that knowledge to other people, but most positions do. In the not-for-profit world, we're constant storytellers and advocates and representatives of our organization, and so the need to be able to take the information in our mind and translate it outwards is pretty critical. Likewise, if you're looking at perceived credibility alone, it's great to be someone who has solid body language, good eye contact, you have a good voice, but if you're speaking nonsense, people are eventually going to stop listening and they're going to stop connecting with you. So we need to bring these two things together. We need knowledge and experience, which everyone in this room has, and then we need to use it in a way that connects effectively and strategically with other people. The last foundational thing that's important to recognize here is that when we're talking about technical and perceived credibility, we're looking at the difference between a rational and emotional response to information. Now, prefacing this, when I say rational, I don't mean reasonable. I mean people are connecting rationally and informationally with what you're putting out there and assessing it based upon the knowledge and experiences that they have collected through their lived experiences. It doesn't mean they'll agree, and it doesn't mean that their response will be reasonable. It simply means that it's a rational approach to information. More importantly, however, when you're looking at perceived credibility, you're looking at an emotional response. And that emotional response often comes first. People react first emotionally to a thing, a person, an idea, and then react emo rationally. And the challenge here is that all of us have different idiosyncrasies about ourselves that connect in different ways with different people preconceptions that we cannot control. Everything from gendered preconceptions to the way you present, to your race, to your culture. These preconceptions exist in any and every audience that you're likely to speak to, consciously or unconsciously, at some level. I want to keep it in mind that when we're talking about perceived credibility through body language and the way we interact, part of what we're talking about is how to augment the way you communicate so that we can at least try to overcome some of those barriers. This isn't like a hardline strategy to overcome preconceptions and prejudices that exist in the world, but at least in my own lived experience, I've found that being a clear, effective communicator has certainly helped. So with all those things, I wanna to touch on the first pillar, and that is authority. Because authority, in many ways, comes before speaking, and it's your technical credibility at work. The reason authority has value as something that you've built up over time is because it makes it easier for people to trust you. If you have authority in your field, if you've published, if you've created some kind of paper trail about you knowing what you're talking about, it's easier for people to connect with you when you're actually in front of them. Now, authority works on a couple of levels. There's organizational authority based upon where you work, based upon whom you work with, but there's also demonstrated authority. 
And that is created through demonstrations of expertise. It's created through publishing something on a personal blog or in an official magazine. It's done through successful projects. It's done through, I mean, it's done through awards, I guess. Awards, I find, matter less nowadays. But all of this is all about showcasing to the world that you know what you're doing. And a lot of this is pre-work. So for myself personally, I tend to publish on LinkedIn articles, or I've seen many in the fundraising community publish on the AFP Toronto blog or in Hillborn Charity. All of those are expressions of authority. Every time you record a talk that you're doing and publish it, it's an expression of authority. Even a personal blog or vlog or podcast is an expression of authority. And it's valuable because the way in which we approach authority has changed. In the past, a lot of it would be granted authority, like I'm a CEO of something or I started a tech company, therefore I automatically have value and that's why I'm on stage. But that's not really how speaking and communication, especially in the formal setting, is approached nowadays. A lot of the time, title tends to kind of go along with knowledge and expertise, but not always. We're seeing a lot more people with fresh, bright ideas who, irrespective of rank, are able to get up and communicate and have an audience connect with them and listen. So authority is something that we also build intentionally because it comes down to how you promote your expertise in advance of actually connecting with a person in person. In short, it's branding. It's how you brand yourself effectively so that people assume you know what you're talking about before you actually start speaking. At the end of the day, authority, and this is the last we'll touch on authority for now because it really is, when it comes to speaking, authority is pre-work. Authority shortens the distance between hearing and implementing. Because when people hear something from someone they don't know and who hasn't expressed or showcased authority either through their speaking and communication or through prior publication of some kind, it's harder for them to implement. There's less trust and more skepticism. But if you build authority in advance as part of the lifestyle of good communication, authority is helpful because it makes your life easier when it comes to connecting with other people on stage, as we're doing right now. So let's talk about the actual art of speaking and telling stories. Because storytelling is important. Anyone who's seen me uh, talk at Congress or other similar events will know that I, I love this quote. And it's from Yuri Hassan, neuroscientist, 2016 TEDx talk, where he talked about how, to our surprise, we saw that all these complex patterns within the listeners actually came from the speaker's brain. In their test, they measured the brain waves of the storyteller and the listener as one listened to stories from the other. And they found that the brain waves of both actually synchronized and the listener drew the pattern of their brainwaves from the storyteller. The point of this is that as we all know, storytelling is powerful. The way that we tell stories helps us connect our minds to the minds of our listeners. Now often this can be expanded to talk about how we tell stories effectively in terms of other marketing avenues, social media, direct mail, etc. But in this case we're going quite literally because we're up and telling stories and telling, about, telling stories about our organization, about people within our organization, and about the good work our organization does. The question, of course, becomes, how do we take speaking, especially when we're not literally coming up and telling either our own personal story or the story of somebody else within our organization or the story of a beneficiary, how do we take storytelling and apply it effectively to the world of speaking? And what that comes down to is understanding kind of the hero's journey, that narrative arc, and applying it to the world of public speaking and professional communication. As you can tell, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, so I'm gonna use Lord of the Rings as an example of good storytelling. Because at the end of the day, when you look at something like Lord of the Rings, when you look at something like Harry Potter or any of the other <coughs> big name stories out there, they all follow kind of a similar narrative arc. You have status quo, a world that exists in some way, and then something changes, or something has changed. And it's shaken the foundations and the context of that status quo to the core. There's a change that exists in the world. You're then introduced to kind of the scope of the world around you. You're painted a picture, you're given a bit of framing around, okay, this is the universe we live in, here are the rules, here's what people interact with, here's how everything works. Then the hero goes on a journey. And this journey has already, for the most part, been flagged for you right from the beginning. At the very beginning, you know, spoiler alert, when Frodo got the one ring, we already knew that at the end of the day, he was going to Mordor to defeat the Dark Lord, right? That was flagged for us right at the very beginning. And so now we know that over three books worth of time, 
This person is gonna go on this big journey with their band of heroes in order to get themselves to the end of this journey and so affect some sort of change, reach some climactic moment or a series of climactic moments that will address the challenge that existed in the world and change the way that we interact with it as people, denizens, readers, etc. Now, this is something that we can apply to virtually any presentation with varying degrees of complexity. I'm gonna go with a kind of a simplistic approach right at the beginning, right, for a very simple style of presentation, and then we'll talk about how that interacts conversationally and with a little more complexity. So, applying the hero's journey. The first thing we have in the hero's journey, and I'm gonna translate these into functional, practical things, is an inciting incident. This is the thing that exists in the world that has changed. There is context of some kind that presents why something has shifted. So, for example, an easy example of this is any time there's a call for relief funding. The world has a certain context around it, something has changed, a natural disaster, a war, something along that line, and now there's a need for something to exist. There's a need for something to shift. Likewise, that inciting incident could be a problem that's always existed in the world, and now the rise of your organization is the thing that's going to change that, is the thing that's going to shape the status quo to its foundations. Context is important, and the inciting incident being the first part of this journey is how we present that. The next part is the rising action. Here's where you provide a bit of framing and a bit of content. Here's where you give more information. You begin the journey. You tell people where they're gonna end up before they end up there, and you take them on the journey through information that you provide that backs the challenge that you positioned in the world or the value that your organization brings to the table. Then, of course, you have the climax, one or a number of different moments of action within a presentation that change the way that we are going to approach things or change the way a person behaves and interacts. And finally, you have the close, which is how the world has changed because of the action taken in the climax. Inciting incident, rising action, climax, and close. So how does this translate into a presentation where you're not literally telling the story of a person who has in some way moved from point A, where they were in the status quo, to where they are now? It comes down to a few things. The inciting incident gives context. So every time you get up in front of a group of people and start talking about a thing, the question on their mind is, why do I care? Why do I care about this? And, and some people may have that intrinsically already, but it's a weird thing to assume that everybody does. Especially if you're speaking conversationally. If people, like today, all of you have opted into hearing this presentation. But a lot of the time when you're just talking about your, your work, the stuff you do, your nonprofit journey, the value of your organization, people haven't always opted into that conversation necessarily. It's just something that came up through the course of your presentation. Especially if it's to a new prospect or a new potential donor, they might not know why they personally care about something yet, or at least why they care about something enough to take action. So every presentation, no matter what that presentation is, every time you make a point, should always start by giving context. Context specifically, not for why it matters to you, but for why a thing should matter to other people, or specifically to the people that you're talking to, based upon what you know about them. In the context of this presentation, I know that all of you are gonna communicate about your organization at some point. Based on the fact that you opted in here, I assume that on some level you wanna get better at professional speaking and communication. So I use that to build context into the presentation around why this presentation, or any presentation, may be valuable to the audience. The rise in action is framing and content. This is that whole thing where you tell people what you're gonna tell them before you tell it to them. Framing or road mapping is important because the way that we take in information is first linear, meaning that we remember best the last thing that we were told by a person. By framing a presentation for people and telling them kind of the roadmap of where you're gonna go, the major points you're gonna be making before you make it, and this is even in conversation, even when somebody presents an idea about, I don't know, politics or something that you disagree with. Making your points about what you're gonna talk about before you get into it, even if you're talking for like 15 seconds, is valuable because it allows people to connect broadly with the points that you're bringing to the table. After that is content. It's the, the meat and potatoes of your presentation, the things that you want to talk about, the value your organization brings, your proof of concept, 
your relationship with beneficiaries, the good stories that you have based upon the good work that you do. All of that is then rising action and context. And content. Then of course you have the climax. And the climax is a call to action. This is something that you want people to do. It could be as simple as changing their mindset. My call to action here is simply to take good public speaking practices and implement them into your lives to be better communicators. But every presentation should have a call to action of some kind. Should be talking about some way to change the way in which you interact with the world. You being the audience. It could be as specific as becoming a certain kind of donor. It could be as general of becoming a member of the community of supporters. It could be about volunteering or why more people should volunteer for a certain event. It could be run that race, it's super important. It could also be something as simple as, I want to have sushi tonight for dinner, but the person that I'm speaking to would rather go for wings. What do we do, right? And so when we're having that discussion, any discussion, the call to action is all about how you take people from where they are and position and ask to them so that they'll move towards something else. Now, most of the time, people stop there. They make the ask, I mean, all of this being relatively basic so far, too many presentations lack context, but I think we're all on the same page when it comes to framing and content and telling your stories and having good content within your presentations or within your conversations. Most people stop their presentation, though, at the climax of the presentation, the call to action. They've done all of these things, they've made their ask, and now that's it. We're done. We're waiting for a response. But remember, People take in information in a linear fashion. Even when you frame something for them, people will always remember best the last thing you said to them. So, what you wanna do is make sure the last thing you say to people is how taking action in the way that you expressed action will make their lives better. You want to give context again but context in the way of which it'll have an impact, the action that you asked for will have an impact on a person's life. It could be a very tangible impact, depending on the person is. I mean, I know it's kind of a dirty word, but maybe people are motivated by tax returns. I don't know, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there. But most people, it's emotional well-being and an emotional shift that takes place, a feeling of having done good, a feeling of having contributed. That's something that taps into people's passions. And reminding them of that, reminding them specifically of the good work that will come from taking action in the way that you describe is unbelievably valuable. Because it leaves people on an emotional high at the end of your presentation, and it leaves people feeling like they've contributed and been part of something before they've even taken action. And so that makes them more likely in turn to actually take the action. Because now the action isn't in the context of this is a person who has a problem with the world and they want me to change. This is a, this is a problem in the context of, wow, if I take this action, good things will happen in the world and good things will also happen to me. And laying things out like this in a format that I call the presentation hourglass is valuable because it allows you to take information and ideas from a very, very broad scope and context where people may not even know a lot about the challenge that your organization is addressing through to framing that in a way that they can take in and interact with and then giving content to go along with it, telling stories, showing the value of your organization, all the way through to making a call to action of some kind so that people know what you want them to do, how you want them to do it, and then showcasing the good that will come out of taking that action. The reality is that we, and I mean this broadly, and this is not meant to be a moral commentary, I, I see it as simply a reality. We all experience inertia. We all experience inertia in terms of whether or not we want to make a decision or take action, even when there's a lot of social good associated with that action. To help people take that action, what we want to do is lay out very clearly what a problem is that exists in the world, how you, the organization, are addressing that challenge or how that challenge is addressed. Then give them information that supports that. And that's a combination of, of stories and information about who you are, for example, depending on the context of the presentation. Give them something that they can interact with. Every presentation should have a call to action of some kind, and not an implied call to action of, look at all the good work we do, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, you should totally support us. 
It has to be a distinct call to action that connects with people and gives them a clear path to taking action in some way, even if it's the simple action of adjusting something within the context of their own life. And then showing them context again, showing them how it will benefit them and benefit the world if they are to take that action. Now, of course, when we're talking about this, this is to do with simple presentations, right? Simple presentations that you can easily go through. All right, I'm giving big context. I'm gonna list the three things I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna give a call to action, and then I'm gonna say this is how it'll benefit the world, and that's it. But there are presentations that are more complex, and that's something that we're gonna talk about in a sec. Because at the end of the day, the reality is that speaking is about taking people on a journey from what they believe to what you want them to believe. That's at the core of good speaking. And that's at the core of good communication. Because it goes beyond simply standing up on a stage like I'm doing right now and delivering a presentation to an audience. Every time you connect with someone and talk about your work or your passions, you are shifting their mindset in terms of how they approach or will approach that problem next time, that challenge next time, that idea next time. So what we want to do is do that strategically in every form of presentation. So like I said, some presentations are more complex because some presentations are a little longer than 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour. Some are very, very informationally heavy. For example, board presentations for the more, for the people who have the, I mean, sort of the misfortune of being in the more corporate end of their nonprofit. <laughs> Prospect presentations where you're speaking to people who could donate and could give, who maybe need, especially if they're a major donor, a little more than the warm fuzzies of your presentations or the tragedy of your presentation in order to connect with an idea and make a rational decision to give large sums of money to whatever the cause happens to be. There's also panels where you have multiple speakers. So here you have a host delivering a question and you have a whole bunch of people who are giving a response in a somewhat disjointed fashion. Every single one of those people has to both provide clarity and confidence in their own answer and then feed off of what everybody else said in order to provide an effective answer in turn. And then of course you have conversations. Because again, and I'm gonna repeat this a bunch of times, intentional speaking is a lifestyle choice. It's something that you choose to do effectively in order to connect with other people. And this isn't one of those stories where, yeah, I've always been an extrovert and great at, at presentations, and so now I'm gonna tell you how to do what I've never done. When I was speaking as a, as a youngster, I had a lisp, and that lisp was fairly pronounced and something that was a pretty big challenge to actually teach myself out of. And because of that, and a combination of other sad social factors about being the only colored person in all the way school in a small town in Ontario, uh, you know, I was, I was someone who wasn't often at the forefront of speaking in class, communicating socially, and connecting with other people. Luckily, Toronto is, first of all, much more you know, multicultural. But also, learning how to speak intentionally and effectively through things like, in my case, competitive debate, helped me significantly in terms of how I was able to connect with people in industry and socially interpersonally. Now, of course, when you're in the context of those types of presentations, it's not always as simple as here's one big piece of context, here's how we're gonna talk about it, here's the information, here's what you should do. There are many times multiple levels of context that need to take place throughout. So this is something that I've always considered to be kind of the, the DNA of presentation or the DNA of conversation. Because what you end up having a lot of the time is something that looks like this. A whole bunch of these mini hourglasses stacked one on top of another. And the easiest place to see this is when you have another person speaking to you. And so now, you don't just have you on a stage giving a long presentation. You have a call and response, which is a lot of the time the case, especially if there's a Q&A within whatever presentation you happen to be giving. In a world where you have two people speaking and responding to one another, there is no option to get up and just give a wicked soliloquy about this is who you are, this is what you do, this is the context, and this is the journey I'm gonna take you on. Because these are small snippets of interpersonal interaction. The most clear conversations are the ones where in a call and response between one person and another, you listen to a person's point of view, give context for why you agree, disagree, or somewhere in between, talk about, then give very briefly why you agree or disagree for maybe like a couple of levels, and then you give information to support it, and then your point of view becomes the call to action. For example, if you're talking about something along the lines of, I don't know, 
whether Doug Ford's policies are great for Ontario, right? When somebody espouses that, they actually agree with some of them. No offense if anybody does. I'm just use a <laughs> topical example. If somebody espouses that they agree with, for instance, educational reform in the way that uh, you know Ford has suggested would be the best way forward with this, you might say that you are. You might, in response to this, give context for why you, through your lived experiences, do not find that approach to education or healthcare or tuition to be in the best interests of both the stakeholders involved and the province as a whole. And then you might draw on one or two points from your personal experience, statistics or information that you've read, and then list why you think that you are right and Ford's policies aren't the best thing in the world for Ontario. It's all about taking in information from the other person, giving them a bit of context for why your ideas might contradict theirs or partially agree with theirs and then going through the information that supports it. When you're on a panel, you're in a similar line because now a person has asked a question and now you have a few people who are addressing that question in turn. So every time it's your turn to speak again, you need to give a little more context for why another person's opinion or the host's question matters or changes in the context of your life and the life of the people who you're speaking to and then give information to support that. For more complex presentations like I mean, a board presentation where you're going through the work that your nonprofit has done over the last year or a couple of years, depending on whatever period it is that you interact with your board, the multiple levels of context come into play in terms of how each section that you're going through should interact with the board on a different level. From fiscals all the way through to the stories that you're telling people that are supposed to strike an emotional or empathetic chord. But at the end of the day, what you want to do is take people on a journey. You want to bring them to a point where they are able to listen to the words that you're saying, understand how it applies contextually to their own lives, and then see how they can approach your ideas in a way that is clear, comfortable, shows them the information and the emotional stories that go along with it, gives them a clear call to action, a clear ask, a clear next step that they can take, and then showcases for them how that will benefit their lives. When you're able to do that, you're able to take people pretty effectively from the broad strokes of why your ideas matter, all the way through to how your ideas should matter to them. Remember, when it comes to presentation, when it comes to communication, it's all about taking people from what they believe to what you want them to believe. And that's about showcasing how, in your case, your organization and the work that your organization does is valuable, not just to the beneficiaries at hand, but also to that individual in their life in the context of their own lived experience. But in order to do this, we need to be able to present the idea effectively. And that's what projecting confidence is all about. Now, I want to talk about the word projecting for a second. Because when it comes to confidence, a lot of the time we see confidence as a highly internalized metric. We feel confident in ourselves. We have our own self-perceptions. That's what confidence is. But confidence can be, for want of a better word, client-facing. In the context of this, in the context of projecting confidence, we're not talking about how you feel. We're talking about what people see. The beauty of presentation, especially formal presentation, is that most of the time, people are rooting for you to succeed because they've taken an hour out of their day or more, and now they need to actually make a decision on whether or not this was a useful time spent. So they're hoping you do well. So people tend to project onto you what they would expect to see from a speaker, which is a confident person who knows what they're talking about, who has strong body language and is able to connect with the audience around them and deliver valuable information. They project that onto you, and so you, in turn, as part of your relationship with the audience, need to project that outwards as much as possible. This is also not about falling into that kind of, let's call it artistic form of presentation that we saw at the beginning where you're suddenly turning on your speaker voice. The world of speaking has changed through people like Tony Robbins back when, and now more recently, Simon Sinek, and even more recently, Gary Vaynerchuk, loath as I am to cite his presentation skills. Because it's all interpersonal, it's very real, it's very much who the person is. What we're looking at here are ways to augment how you communicate to become more effectively and show the audience the confidence that they expect to see in the speaker. And there are two levels to that. Level one 
is confident body. Level two is confident voice. Through the way that you interact with an audience physically and through the way that your voice sounds, that is how you connect most effectively with individuals, taking a clear presentation all the way through. And these are two things that we're going to address over the next few minutes, talking about how we format ourselves physically in order to project our voice more effectively to the audience at large. So, projecting confidence 101. This is all talking about confident body. Step one, keep your feet planted. Because a lot of the time, see, when it comes to presentation, the big challenge that we have is we have a lot of unconscious gestures that come into play that make the way in which we speak per be perceived by the audience differently than how we think we're being perceived. And one of them is that we all have a tendency, especially when we're uncomfortable, to start rocking back and forth, right? One of the, one of the ones that I've seen, and, and I will say that I have specifically seen this with women when they speak or people who present as, is the crossing the leg and uncrossing the leg. I mean, you can do it while you're sitting, I mean, whatever. Um, <laughs> but when you're standing, when you're asked a question, when you're uncomfortable, for men, a lot of the time it's this, and then this, maybe a casual bit of this, <laughs> there's a podium, right? But there's also a lot of this, and the uncrossing again, and the crossing again. And the thing is, these aren't things people do intentionally, right? These are unconscious gestures, either tell that all of us have developed over time based on the social context of who we are and what we do. Another one is the hand gestures that start here and just kind of do this. I mean, somebody taught the person at some point that hand gestures are important, but hand gestures that close off your body language aren't effective hand gestures. We all have things that we do that are conscious or unconscious that are detrimental to our presentation. Think of these uh, next few steps as kind of a template for how you can start getting rid of some of those unconscious interactions to allow you to speak more effectively. Some of these may seem super basic, but the thing is that all of us do them, whether or not we consciously know about them or not. I catch myself doing them frequently. Even while I've been here, I tend to shift my weight back and forth from foot to foot. It's an unconscious gesture that I do my best not to do, but it does happen, and it happens for everyone. So keeping it conscious, top of mind, helps make that less likely to happen. So, step one, keep your feet planted. Step two, keep your back straight. Part of the reason for this is that people interact, again, first emotionally with an idea and then rationally. You as the speaker are the representative of your idea on stage. Even if you have a video, even if you have a photo, people connect best empathetically with something that is tangible and physical and right there in front of them. They'll start connecting with you, then they'll shift to anything else. So if you're slumped, if you're slouched, then you give a poor impression of the value of your idea. The way I see it a lot of the time is that you need to be a stable force on stage connecting with other people and connecting with your audience. If you are shifting back and forth, if you are unsteady, if you look unsteady, in the context of what you're capable of doing as an individual, then your idea looks similarly unsteady. I am blessed in that I'm able to very easily stand up straight and keep my feet planted. So this isn't about standing like me. This isn't about standing like any other speaker. This is about being as solid, stable, and planted as you are capable of being in the context of your own life. I once had a, an individual in an audience that I was speaking to talk about, ask me how they could do this because they walked with crutches or used a wheelchair. And the thing is that this same concept of being stable and steady can be done whether you're standing or whether you're sitting. It's about what you are able to do. Even when you're sitting, we tend to have, or at least I tend to have, really bad posture. Be it sitting back like this, slouching in our chairs, or hunching forward in our chairs. Being stable, keeping our feet planted and our back straight as much as possible, applies whether we're standing or sitting. And it's about formatting yourself well to be able to connect most effectively with your audience. And there are also elements to this that are physiological in terms of how we approach the idea of voice. But at the end of the day, it starts here. Keep your feet planted and keep your back straight. The next thing is set your shoulders back. Because all of us who sit in front of laptops very regularly are blessed with horrible posture. 
especially us who live in a smartphone world, are blessed with horrible posture because we spend a lot of our time like this, with our phone in hand. That changes the way your voice sounds, first and foremost, and we'll touch on that in a sec. But it also, again, provides a poor image of the ideas that you are attempting to convey. So start with your feet planted, however that's comfortable for you. Straighten your back and set your shoulders back. The next thing is take deep breaths from the diaphragm. And this is where we're gonna talk about the idea of confident voice. Because confident voice is really a lot about the physio physiology of how we go about speaking to other people. Most of the time, we breathe thoracically, which is we take really shallow breaths, and we can consider this our regularly scheduled breathing. What we wanna do is something that is closer to athletic breathing, especially if you're up on a stage speaking to a large group of people. The easiest way to show this is the difference between what you're able to do with or with your voice, whether or not you're breathing thoracically or diaphragmatically. So, taking shallow breaths from my chest, and you see this a lot of the time in speakers, for me to get any louder than I am now requires me changing the volume of my voice to shoot it to the back of the audience. It means I'm taking breaths more often and I'm less capable of connecting with people in the back of the room. I also run out of breath much faster. When you breathe from the diaphragm and couple it with tilting your chin up, you're able to project your voice effectively around the room. So, this is a bit of a dramatic example, but for example, when I'm breathing from my diaphragm, I really don't need a mic. I'm able to project my voice fairly easily throughout the room by, for want of a better word, changing the gain of my voice rather than actively trying to get louder and louder and louder in order to reach more people. So while most of us tend to use a mic when we're on stage, it's not strictly necessary. And part of the way to get there, <coughs> if your voice is capable of being loud enough to get there, is by breathing effectively from your diaphragm and then tilting your chin up so you can project your voice outward to more areas within an auditorium, within a room, to a small group of individuals. It's also valuable because the way in which we breathe and the way in which we interact with words changes how people perceive us. Breathing diaphragmatically, you have more air, you have more oxygen, you can speak for longer without taking another breath. When you're breathing thoracically, you need to breathe more often, and that gives your voice both a breathy quality, which is less pleasant in a speaker, but also it means that you have to breathe more often, which makes your presentation in turn seem more frantic. So keep your feet planted, keep your back straight, set your shoulders back, tilt your chin up, and smile when possible. This is something that I tend to keep forgetting, even though I keep putting it on a slide deck because I'm not naturally a significant <coughs> smiling individual. However, smiling is valuable because it changes the sound of your voice. If you think of like your voice and your entire formatting of your body like a woodwind instrument, for example, or a trumpet, you're able to format your body in a way that creates a richer, more powerful iteration of your voice. It's not about having a deep, booming voice, it's about having the best quality of voice for yourself. By formatting yourself in a way that you're able to stand tall and breathe diaphragmatically, you can achieve a better quality of voice than you might achieve otherwise. A compressed stance in poor body language tends to compress the diaphragm, making it actually impossible to breathe effectively diaphragmatically and project your voice out to other people. So, feet planted, back straight, shoulders back, tilt your chin up, and smile. There's a reason that people in like telecom companies and, and with cold calling talk about smiling when you're on the phone. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that we can hear a smile in a person's voice before we even interact with them. And on an interpersonal level, when you're speaking in front of an audience, smiling is useful, especially socially, because it taps into the idea of mirroring. And that's the unconscious reflection of behavior of another person when we connect with that person's idea. You'll see it when you see two people getting excited and one person leans closer and the other person also leans closer. They're mirroring their behavior of their conversational partner. Smiling is an easy, is like a low hanging fruit for this because it's very hard not to smile back when another person smiles at you. We're keyed to do that socially and that's something that we as speakers can tap into. The next part of this is eye contact. And I love talking about eye contact because eye contact honestly is one of the most difficult parts of speaking. Shifting body language, 
uh, standing properly, having good hand gestures, that's fairly straightforward. It's something you can practice pretty easily. But eye contact is inherently uncomfortable. And that's because the longer that we maintain directed eye contact with an individual, the more intimate that interaction becomes. It has social connotations, but it also has emotional connotations. And that intimacy isn't just like the quote unquote romantic intimacy, it also looks angry a lot of the time, right? And it's uncomfortable for both people. So because of that, a lot of the time when people are making eye contact, they tend to look down or look away or do something along that lines that breaks that eye contact. One myth that I'm gonna dispel right off the bat is this idea that you can make eye contact with your audience by looking over their heads. I don't think many people believe that anymore, but I do like to mention it just in case because it, it doesn't. Whoever made that up was like just lying to you. If I did this entire presentation to that poll in the middle of the room, I mean, does this look like I'm looking at you? Does this, does this feel like an intimate conversation? Now I'm speaking to the exit sign, right? Like, I mean, how is this, how is this a better speaking experience or even a, even a sort of good speaking experience? You also can't just focus on three or four friendly faces in an audience because eye contact is engagement. Seeing a person's eyes is how we determine whether or not they are actually engaging with us. So the question is, because we know eye contact is, is uncomfortable, how do we do it effectively? We're gonna talk about it on two levels first, in a small group and then one-on-one, -on -one, and then we're gonna talk about a large audience. Because the large audience question is, I mean, weirdly enough, the large audience one is actually the easiest. It's actually the easiest place to make eye contact. One-on-one -on -one is the most difficult. So, in a small group, it's pretty straightforward. So if I chose this table at the front, for example, we're, we're a small group. What you do is you start with one person and you hold eye contact. You don't look like you're just like flitting away. So for video, maybe one, two, three. Then you switch to another person at random. Make eye contact for one, two, three. And then switch to a third person at random. So on and so forth. Making sure that you've met the eyes of every person in your small group at the beginning, right when you start your presentation. And then you can start choosing them one or the other at random with different frequencies. Now, you'll notice that I've used the word random a couple of times. And that's important because we want to avoid, and we're gonna talk about this for a sec in large audience as well, is what I call the lighthouse effect. This is not eye contact. This is me just sweeping my gaze vaguely and rhythmically across the room. I'm sure eyes were contacted at some point in this, but there's no intimacy to that relationship. There's no sense of I'm speaking to you right now and this particular point is meant only for you. There's no point to, from what I was saying to him, I mean, we're having a great interpersonal conversation right now and I love that we were able to get together just us one-on-one -on -one and have this chat, right? Because that's the idea that you're projecting out when you make eye contact effectively with people, that this conversation is just for them. It's those moments, especially, I mean, if you go see, if you're, if you're a person who's into the motivational speaking scene, right, and you're into being motivated by speakers, then you'll see that a lot of the actually good ones do this quite well. They'll pick people at times. They'll, they'll use general audience strategy for larger audience, but they'll pick people and say three, four, or five words just to them, right? And it'll feel very intimate. It'll feel very one-on-one. -on -one. And that's a powerful thing. And it's something that we can all implement. It's actually very easy to do. You start with one person for a beat of one, two, three. Shift to another person for a beat of one, two, three. Make sure that you in turn meet the eyes of, and even if they're not looking at you, by the way, make sure you meet the eyes of every person or at least look towards them. Because you don't want to exclude people from the conversation. Eye contact is engagement. The way in which we connect with people most effectively is through our eyes wherever possible. So that means that what we should be doing when we're connecting with people effectively in a small group is making sure that we meet the eyes of every single person in that group and then at random continue to connect throughout the course of your presentation. Now one-on-one -on -one is a little more complicated because the value that we have in a small group is that we're able to have a bit of a break between eye contact. In that few seconds when we shift from one person to another, we get a few seconds off. Where we're not making eye contact with anyone, nobody else is making eye contact, so that kind of relieves the pressure for a moment. Because at the end of the day, that's what builds up with protracted eye contact, pressure. And it's uncomfortable emotional pressure. So breaking eye contact relieves that pressure. And what people tend to do, because of this one-on-one, -on -one, 
is they tend to make eye contact for a few seconds and then flit away, look down, look to the side, look up. But again, that's not an effective way of connecting with people. And it's actually, I mean, bringing us back to this idea that looking over a person's head doesn't look like you're looking at them. Here is a, a wonderful and, I mean, kind of rude test that I like to advise audiences to give a go at, to test why eye contact is important. The next time you're talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, try at the after party. Make <laughs> eye contact with them for a few seconds, and as you're nodding, slowly drift your gaze over one shoulder, and then bring it back. And then as you're talking, slowly drift your gaze over the same shoulder, and bring it back. By time three or four, I'll be very surprised that person isn't like. <laughs> and slowly, she can, they'll turn their entire body toward them because eye contact is engagement. And if you're not making eye contact with them, that means that you're making eye contact with something else. You're looking at something else. Your focus is elsewhere. So we need to find a way to connect with people one on one without breaking gaze continuously throughout the course of the conversation. Now that's particularly important when you're having a conversation with intention, with a purpose. If you're trying to convince someone to support your organization, your cause, etc., and you're not able to make consistent eye contact with them, and their engagement keeps getting broken by the lack of eye contact, that is not a very effective way of telling a story. So, when it comes to eye contact, what we want to do is take advantage of the fact that, I'll say, the majority of people that you will likely interact with have two eyes. So you can potentially, based on the person and based upon their context, make eye contact from one eye to the other. An easy test for this, uh, to demonstrate what I mean by this, is hold up both fingers. If you're holding up two fingers in front of you and you look right in the middle, both fingers are out of focus. If you shift slightly to the left, this finger is in focus, this finger is out of focus. Shift this way, the opposite. This finger is in focus, this finger is out of focus. The same principle applies to good eye contact. Make eye contact with one eye for a beat of one, two, three, focus your attention there, and then shift after a beat of three to the other eye for a beat of one, two, three. By doing that, you're able to both make continuous eye contact while simultaneously maintaining general eye contact with that individual. This is, I mean, realistically, this is like romantic eye contact. Like what you see in the movies, and when they do that really like wicked close up and you know that the person likes the other person because their eyes are sort of twitching back and forth, right? That's what this is. That's actually the action that we're taking just in a non-romantic context, right? We're focusing on one eye for a beat of one, two, three, shifting to the other eye for a beat of one, two, three, and then shifting back. The reason being that slight break when you move from one eye to the other breaks the pressure and releases the pressure that comes with protracted eye contact that will either make the eye contact unpleasantly intimate or very, very angry. So, small groups. Focus on each member randomly for a beat of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, until you've acknowledged everyone in the group initially and then move on to connecting with them at random making sure you don't just do sweeping eye contact across the board. One on one, you're focusing on one eye and then the other for a beat of one, two, three, one, two, three, in order to maintain protracted eye contact without the unpleasant pressure that comes along with it. Now, a large audience is a little different because now you have an untenable number of humans to make direct eye contact with, but you still need to be able to give the impression that you're making direct eye contact. Here, it's somewhat easy because you can split this audience up into maybe four major quadrants. But sometimes the audience gets even bigger. And so what we're gonna do is look at uh, a really big auditorium and look at how you go about approaching that. When you maybe can't even always see the faces of the people that you're supposed to be connecting with. The first thing you do is you split the audience into, for example, thirds. Now you can use whatever distribution you want. This is the distribution that I tend to use. Part of the reason for this is that especially when you have stakeholders in the audience, one of the things that we tend to do is focus only on those people. Using this strategically forces you to do other things. So you split the audience up into thirds. In this case, with an audience of this size, I would split it down the middle as well, which leaves you with one, one, two, three, four, five, six segments of the audience. Or, in the context of this, six people that you're now connecting with. You've turned your audience 
into a small group. And the reason that this works is because engagement and being engaged in a presentation is contagious. You see it a lot of times in, in classrooms are a really easy place to see it. If one kid's a distraction, everyone around them becomes distracted. But if one kid is showing that they're really into whatever's happening right now, then it makes the other people feel bad for being distracted. And so they focus back on the presentation at hand. And you see it at every level. Engagement is a contagious thing. So what we're doing right now is throwing eye contact out into different parts of our audience and letting the ripples of that engagement spread to connect with the people around them. And I mean, in some cases, maybe you have an audience where there are a few people that you can connect with individually. Generally speaking, what I would suggest is, especially if it's a really big audience, focus on a few centric points and make eye contact with different people if you can see them within those points. So that in the end, standing at the front of an auditorium, you might focus, focus first here, then here, then here. Making sure, as always, that we're not just sweeping across the entire audience, we're making directed eye contact for a period of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three. This is essentially what I've been doing throughout this presentation. I split the audience into quadrants, so one right down the center by this straight through this pole, and then another straight down the center this way. So I have quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. As much as possible because we have, you know, I can actually see people, I'm trying to make actual directed eye contact with different individuals within those quadrants. But broad strokes, that's what, what I've been interacting with. Quadrant one, then maybe quadrant three, then quadrant two, then quadrant four, <coughs> then quadrant two. And that's how you shoot eye contact out to the room, keep people engaged, and find a way to make sure that people feel your eye contact, even if they're not necessarily always getting that eye contact directly. Does that make sense? Cool. One of the last things that I want to talk about is the idea of PowerPoint. And the reason that I want to do this is because a lot of the time we need to use PowerPoint, and because I, I recently I recently, let's just say, uh, saw a speaker who made the decision to not use PowerPoint and to just get up and talk. And this wasn't like a keynote presentation for 10 minutes. This is a really long talk. And it was very, very difficult to listen to without any visual anchor. So here's a general rule on PowerPoint before I get into how you actually, because I'm going to talk about how to interact well with PowerPoint. But here's a bit of a thing on PowerPoint. Yes. PowerPoint is a useful visual tool, or Prezi, or whatever you want, right? A deck, a slide deck of some kind is a useful visual tool. It is not dead. It is not old school or corporate. Slide decks are useful because people need to connect with you through multiple senses simultaneously. There's a reason why over 50% of podcast listeners listen while doing something else of some kind, driving, working out, anything else. Because we are beings with multiple senses that need to be stimulated simultaneously or we get bored. So unless you are an unbelievably engaging, active, and energetic speaker who's doing like cartwheels across the stage while you're delivering a presentation, unless you're up here doing a Zumba class and so people are actually interacting with you, use a PowerPoint. Use a visual aid of some kind. Use um, a notepad that you can write on. People need a visual anchor for the presentation along with the auditory anchor of your voice and your content and your information. If they don't have that, they get bored. I get bored. Everyone would get bored if there was no visual anchor. It's also much harder to take in information if you're just listening to it and maybe making a couple of notes. But in order to help people connect, because there are many different types of learners within your audience, whoever that happens to be, or types of listeners. Some people connect with visual cues that they can read. Some people connect verbally with what you're saying. Some people are a combination of both. For some people, it's, a, it's another system entirely, right? What you are trying to do as a speaker, to speak effectively and intentionally, is to meet as many of those as possible so that people will connect with you as thoroughly as possible. So yes, use PowerPoint. No, you should not just get up and talk especially if you have a content-heavy presentation. I know it looks very chic, it's like, oh my god, I don't need a PowerPoint. I just, I'm a great speaker by myself. That's fine, but it's not about you. 
It's about the people that you're speaking to and how you can connect most effectively with them. And most people need to look at different versions of information in order to connect effectively with that information. Lastly, lead your slides. Don't let them lead you. As you've seen throughout this presentation, I'm definitely taking a glance toward my PowerPoint to make sure that my PowerPoint and I are on the same page. But if you saw our keynote speaker this morning, they were fabulous at this. Because even when their PowerPoint got behind, they maybe said, oh yeah, uh, this is a quote that I like. But it was all story for them. This is their journey, this is their experience. The slides were there, and the slides certainly augmented the presentation. But the slides weren't the presentation, and then they were there to like narrate the presentation that was written on the slides. You are the primary source of information. So most of that information should be developed by you for your audience. The PowerPoint serves as a visual aid and a visual anchor for your audience, and it also serves as cues for you so that you can more effectively connect with that audience. So the question is, how do we do that well? Because most people do that quite poorly. Um, all right, well, I'll stand here. Usually I like to stand right next to the deck to demonstrate what I'm talking about, but I don't think you'll be able to see me past that poll. So presenting with a PowerPoint. People interact, there are a few rules for this. One, people interact first with the closest thing to them. You want them to interact with you first. So you need to stand a little ahead of your slides. The second thing to take into account is that people read, and let me clarify. In North America, people read from top left all the way down to bottom right. So, if you want people to start with you, naturally in the context of this room, it's a little bit different because I have two slide decks on either side, so I'm just going with front and center. But most of the time you don't have that. Most of the time you'll have one deck or one opportunity to present with something. What you want to do is be a little forward and to the right of your slides. The reason for this is that people interact first with the first thing they see, the closest thing to them. You want that to be you. They also read from top left, as you're looking at it, to bottom right. Which means that in the context of how people are used to taking in information, they start with the thing to the left first. You again want that to be you. You as the speaker should have most of the, organ most of the information. Your slide deck isn't designed to just be kind of the written version. Like your slide deck isn't your speaking notes. This isn't the written version of your presentation. Your slide deck is there to augment presentation with imagery, with stories, with ideas, with things that balance you out so that the audience has something to look at that reflects the information you're giving them while you're giving them that information. By standing a little forward and stage right of your slides, you have an opportunity to tap into the fact that, at least in North America, people read in a way that they would start with you, look at your slides, and then turn the page to come back to you. At the end of the day, when it comes to public speaking and professional presentation and professional communication, this really comes down to intentionally making the decision to connect more effectively with the people around you. I want to reiterate that this isn't just about standing up on a, on a formal stage and doing this. This isn't just about that board presentation. This isn't just about that mixer where you're talking to donors and need to be on. This is about making every interaction intentional and framing your communication and presentation in a way that helps other people buy into the ideas that you're putting out into the world in a way that benefits them and they feel connected to. Empathy plays such a massive role in how we connect with people through storytelling. But although we know a story and we might connect personally with the mission, with the cause, and empathetically with the story that we know, we've experienced, we've maybe even seen firsthand, that story needs to be told well in order to connect with other people. And whether that's by applying the hero's narrative arc to the way in which you tell the story, or slightly reformatting the way that we approach body language, keep that, those feet planted, back straight, shoulders back, smile, tilt your chin up, and breathe from the diaphragm. Whether it's making directed eye contact or making sure that you reformat the way that you present when you do have a visual aid. At the end of the day, this is all about telling your best story in the way that will connect most effectively with your audience. Speaking is all about getting people to do a thing, and it comes back to reframing their mindset 
so that they can buy in to your mission. Thank you. We have time for one question, maybe. <laughs> Go. Um, with the 101 communication, uh, the, sometimes the recipient may not be comfortable with that. So how do you negotiate that when you're trying to have a conversation with them and you're something that maybe they're, they're trying to understand? I mean, when it's... I, Unless they've literally told you I don't like making eye contact, please don't make eye contact with me. Uh, and, and that's not being facetious, I'm, I'm serious, right? Unless they have expressed this in some way, everybody finds eye contact uncomfortable. So that, to me, sounds like it's one of two things. Either they are deeply uncomfortable with eye contact generally, which doesn't mean you should become disengaged and make bad eye contact. It just means you need to make an additional, I'm not saying like follow them down to make eye contact, right? But you need to make the additional effort. Focus on their face, focus on them to the exclusion of all else. Make them feel like the most important person in that conversation. The other option on that is that it, uh, it might be cultural. There might be a cultural kind of impact or a cultural context there that you may not know about. But I also caution very strongly against predicting cultural context just based on nothing that you do. I mean, just as a general rule. I tend to not predict cultural context until the person has flagged to me that there's a context at play. So in that case, I would say, do your part. Focus on their face, generally. Don't take the opportunity to glance away or at your phone and make them feel like the most important person in that conversation, in that room. And you might find that over time, they grow more comfortable and they're able to connect with you more easily. Does that make sense? Am I done? All right, thanks, be great. Thank you for So I think this was a fantastic way to start our fundraising day. Thank you, Mo, for sharing that. I'm actually uh, a known fidgeter and light crosser, so it was great for, for me to to kind of see that and, and uh, really think about that as I am um, presenting shortly. But uh, if he has made a donation uh, to the charity of your choice, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, I also want to remind you to fill out your session evaluation forms. Um, they are on the table, but they're also on the app. So if you just click on this session, uh, scroll down to the bottom, um, it is there. Uh, I also want to thank our sponsor, Focus Communications. Um, and I encourage you, if you need a professional photo taken, uh, there are a minimum of $20 outside, uh, so please do uh, use that service. Uh, we're in for a short break, and uh, then we'll see you at the 11.30 sessions. Thank you. I'll be around throughout the day, and if you all have questions, I'll be at the after party if that wasn't clear. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have questions, I'll be around. Hit me up, tweet at me, email me. Cheers. <laughs>